One of my favorite mottos in life is to live forever or die trying, as it seems like a win-win philosophy to me. But as technology to truly extend lifespan seems to draw closer, we may find out that longer lives open the door to many new problems and dangers too. Welcome to another episode of Science and Futurism with Isaac Arthur, and I am your aforementioned host, Isaac Arthur. Today I'll be going through a lot of the potential ethical conundrums people raise about life extension, and adding some lesser known ones too, as we consider if this is really a technological path we should be pursuing. We'll be trying to treat the subject neutrally, and we're also picking subtopics in part by the frequency I've heard them rather than their specific logical or scientific validity but I feel they should be treated respectfully nonetheless. Many of the arguments apply to other areas of technology as well. I should also say from the outset that I'm a bit biased on the topic. After almost a decade of doing a show on science and futurism, one of the most common questions I get asked is what technology we discuss on this show that I would most like to see invented in my own lifetime, and the answer is life extension technology. And that answer is a bit tongue-in-cheek but also sincere. Nonetheless, as much as I would love to live a much longer and healthier life than a mere 70 or 80 years, I can definitely see some serious issues with this technology being developed. Some of the major ones we'll cover today are that it isn't natural, that immortality is wrong or impossible, that life would get boring, that any treatment that extends life would have unequal access, such that perhaps only the rich or powerful would get it. We worry that in a time of very long lives, upward mobility would be far harder, and perhaps dampen or even halt technological progress or social changes, or that such long lifespans might erode traditional human social fabric, ending the need for children, or require changes to mind and body that rendered you inhuman. We'll mention some others along the way, but those are the big ones, and we'll end by asking if the situation changes if we use a more gradual approach versus sudden major life extension, and then some summary and closing thoughts. And this will take us a while, so grab a drink and a snack, sit back, and give those like and subscribe buttons a smack. We might as well begin with the idea that longer lives are not natural, as it's the biggest topic and a common concern we've addressed before with other technologies, and which also remains the most common concern about life extension. On the one hand, we would often just say no, life extension is not natural, but neither are metal tools or cooked meat. However, while a prosthetic hand isn't natural either, it also isn't universal. Right now, everyone dies of old age if something else doesn't get them first, which until recently was usually the case, and everyone has lost family and friends to it. For me, that's all the more reason to pursue life extension but I think many folks rationalize their grandparents' death as okay because it's part of a natural cycle. Of course that depends a lot on what we mean by nature, as for instance in Abrahamic tradition dying of old age is not natural, it's the byproduct of original sin and living in a corrupted world. We see something similar in Hinduism and Buddhism too, in the past things were less corrupted and people lived longer. We probably need to distinguish between the two major ways people use the term natural, as both of these meanings get used in objections to life extension. First, nowadays a lot of people mean natural in the sense of a world and universe of no inherent morality or purpose, at least as given by a divine creator. Life exists as it does because of Darwinian selection processes and our civilization is molded by those, in which case this concern is still a legitimate one but has a different meaning to the second and order notion of nature, which is in accordance with a divine plan or natural order. In the first case, the concern is that our nature and civilization is a pretty delicate balance and that human civilization is pretty heavily based on our birth rates and lifespans for all sorts of key behaviors and processes. As an example, loving mothers caring for their young is rare enough in nature, fathers more so, but grandparents are super rare, and a lot of that might be because few critters spend much time, proportional to their lifespan, as relatively helpless children needing care and teaching, and don't really survive to a post fertile age much either. That's probably a positive feedback relationship. A tribe with deep bonds doesn't want to get rid of their older members, 
and they have a big development time for big brains like humans, those older and wiser members are valuable commodities. If everyone suddenly grows up to be an adult in mind and body in a year, that relationship might have differed. So too, if that maturation period remained the same, but people lived to a thousand, or never suffered much loss of mental or physical vitality with age. So common sense says that if that's true, then messing with that risks a lot of potential unexpected consequences to society, some of which we'll explore later. But normally this perspective of nature isn't reviewing the natural for itself, just recognizing it as an impressive collection of trial and error that does work and easily tips over, so to be respected and not casually poked, but not inherently sacred or assumed to be best. We have thoroughly embraced the technological augmentation of human health these days, especially from this perspective, but that does not mean every change is wise, especially when new and not tested, and not everyone thinks every change is a good one or that its side effects can outweigh those benefits or at least cut into them. The other half of nature is the natural order idea, and I should note that most people these days could be said to be of two minds on this, or in this camp but also visit the other. But if you believe that nature is sacred or decreed by a higher power, then there is always that concern that any action you take that's not already listed as approved might be desecrating that order or offending that higher power. That's a very common sense attitude if we're taking this perspective too, and I cannot tell you that extending people's lives is not violating that since it's very dependent on which higher power or natural order we're talking about, and even then very prone to interpretation. I can say that I'm not aware of any official consensus in any large modern religion saying life extension is inherently unethical, nor any consensus that it's a great and wise idea that's definitely approved of from on high, and science is in the same boat, it doesn't really do ethical questions well and lends us no special insight on if this is a good idea or not. As we were discussing in our episode Human De-Evolution a couple months back, A lot of traditions hold that humanity has been degenerating over the generations, either because of the world being inherently corrupt or some other triggering event, like Adam and Eve taking culinary advice from the serpent, or the decrease of lifespans from Adam's era to the post-Noah era. And there's lots of other examples from many cultures, but since that's probably the most familiar to most viewers, let's expound on that. If humans once were longer lived and now are not, one reason might be that it is a byproduct of some flaw in ourselves, physical or metaphysical, and a thing which can be fixed. If not, then the ethics of life extension don't really matter because we'd just be tilting at windmills anyway and we'll never find out. Fundamentally though, the not natural argument is not one we can just wave aside from either perspective. I'd make the argument that in for a penny, in for a pound applies, as we already use huge amounts of technology to extend life in so many ways, and I think it's a bit of a nitpick to say that curing cancer is fine and relieving, delaying, or repairing various ailments associated to aging is fine, but trying to move the needle past 120 is wrong. While there have been folks saying 120 is the maximum age for years, but that's media hype there's never been any sort of scientific consensus that humans have a hard biological limit. I think 120 is probably popular because first, we don't have many folks documented beyond that, just the one at the moment with a few at 119, and second, because there's a passage in the Bible, Genesis 6-3 using the NIV, my spirit will not contend with humans forever, for they are mortal, their days will be 120 years. The verse right after that is the one discussing Nephilim and then we get to Noah three verses later, whose grandfather was Methuselah and who was already 600 when the flood came. I've heard it interpreted as a warning that the flood was coming in 120 years too. Skip ahead some more chapters and you've got Abraham and Sarah living to 175 and 127 respectively, and famously having kids when a century old, and their grandson Jacob is said to have died at 147 so presumably it doesn't mean a 120 year maximum lifespan for humans going forward in that period. Obviously this isn't a theological discussion today, but I've heard that 120 maximum idea a lot and it's not a specific stance of science, but I think that comes from a mix of that verse, plus only one solidly documented person making it past 120 thus far, plus the Hayflick limit and telomeres, 
but again that was never a conformed or majority stance of science, and newer research says that if we have a maximum lifespan, which is strongly debated, then it's at least 150. So why doesn't anyone live that long? Well, for a simple analogy, think of it like flipping a coin, if it comes up tails you die. Based on the total combination of all factors, from medical technology to genetics and many points in between, people have an effective time at which half are going to die and half not, then another bit of time till half of the remainder die. If only a million people live to age 100, and current technology means half die each year thereafter, by 110 only a thousand are left and by 120 only one in a million. So if technology lets 10 million folks make it to 100, then 10 folks make it to 120. Alternatively, if technology lets that coin flip be biased to 60% survival each year, rather than 50%, then about 80 folks get to 120. There will also never be a point at which you can completely eliminate all causes of possible death, including suicide, so over a long enough timeline, people will die with some statistical effect that would amount to a lifespan or half-life. While we will use the term biological immortality frequently today, or in other discussions of the topic, that means not aging specifically. That we can replace components or regrow them, not true immortality. There is no real reason to think nature, viewed from either perspective, is insisting on a specific maximum age, and even if it were something like 150, well most of the ethics we need to discuss today would still apply if most people could live to that age especially if their fertility could be extended that long, and that probably is going to be an easier problem to solve, particularly since cryo-freezing some eggs and growing kids in a vat is basically already available technology. We could have more issues with considerably longer lifespans, beyond a thousand years, folks we often refer to as Methuselahs, and we also have folks of considerably longer duration in other traditions too. These might be a bit more of a concern, which we'll discuss later, as they may need massive overhauls to their brains just to keep their memories. But there is the separate issue of if immortality is wrong, and I'd argue that it is indeed a completely separate issue. Under known physics we have a handful of hypothetical ways in which life can be extended infinitely, Dyson's Eternal Intelligence, Tiplow's Omega Point Cosmology, Infinite Scale Duplication, and quantum resurrection being the big four we've discussed in other episodes. We have even more ways to potentially extend lives trillions of years, or even more, but compared to infinity, all finite numbers are nothing. If you've got some eternal life hereafter, that's going on for eternity and at the behest of an all-powerful deity, so no finite life extension is going to get you out of that and no discussion of life extension, medical, transhuman, or digital, is contemplating immortality either, it's just a figure of speech for a very, very long life. Incidentally, if you want rundowns on Dyson's Eternal Intelligence, see our Iron Stars episode, see the Omega Point Cosmology episode for discussion of that, and see our Infinite Improbability Issues and Technological Resurrection episode for the other two. Immortality may be unethical, I view it as impossible in this universe anyway, and also not desirable for reasons we discuss in those episodes, but I don't see how they apply to finite life extension any more than sterilizing an infected wound does. Wanting a longer lifespan than we currently have is not automatically a slippery slope to desperately wanting an infinite lifespan at any cost, as common in fiction and people routinely and knowingly skip on doing things we know extend life these days, like lots of good sleep, exercise, and diet, which truly will add years to your life. Of course some folks find that time jogging or on the exercise bike a bit boring, and there is also that boredom issue, and an infinite time allows infinite boredom, but boredom with existence is a personal issue in my book, some people are bored of life by twenty. I think a lot of those same folks find it interesting again by 30, and I can't imagine being bored of life by 10,000, but for others it might be a century, and my lifespan shouldn't be determined by their issues. If living too long presents a problem, a very obvious solution would seem to present itself. This isn't some fable story where you wished for immortality and now nobody can kill you, including yourself, even if you want to. 
While we sometimes call this biological immortality to mean no inherent maximum age or loss of vitality from age, you are not immortal. Your lifespan has been extended and that extension can be ended, you can stop taking the pill so to speak, shut the nanobots off, and if you are impatient and opposed to suicide, you pick up ever more exciting hobbies till either you stop being bored or you stop breathing. Cliff jumping is an option. A channel favorite is stalking lions and attacking them with nerf bats. The galaxy is an enormous place, as is the human imagination. If all these things bore you, I'm sorry, but that's on you. Your personal level of boredom and how long it takes to reach terminal levels shouldn't be a deciding factor on if others should be able to extend their lives, unless by some coincidence it's a package deal where we are all in for the process or not and for the same period. That's partially applicable to the potential problem of overpopulation though, as we do have a finite amount of resources and there's that concern we would rapidly overstuff the planet and there's that concern that we would rapidly overstuff the planet with people or have to ban any new children, or only a small handful of new births would be allowed, or we would have some crazy lottery at age 100 for who got to keep living or have a kid or whatever. That's not an ethical issue you need to life extension, and I think it's merely a correlated but separate one, but it is also not an urgent new one. There was a spin-off of Doctor Who called Torchwood, where they had a season whereby some techno-magic process nobody could die, called Miracle Day. Folks are immediately worried about critical overpopulation occurring in mere months since people are still being born but nobody is dying. Thing is, as we hit 8 billion people on this planet, there's just under 400,000 babies being born every day, but there's only about 150,000 deaths a day. That's why we have a billion more people in 2023 than 2011 when that show came out. Had none of those deaths occurred since then, that number would be more like 8.5 billion. Not exactly a sudden crisis, the population rising by a billion and a half rather than a billion over a dozen years. So no, if someone invented agelessness or biological immortality, it represents no sudden life or death decision we need to make. You eventually do have a problem, one we already have incidentally. The dynamics change but they did that last century too, a couple of times. Hence why we didn't have a Malthusian catastrophe as many expected. You could have some surprising effects from that too. For instance, a lot of people juggle personal lives, careers, and families, and feel pushed into having a family sooner than later to avoid the built-in expiration date. If that expiration date gets removed or kicked back, the birth rate might drop too. People say, great, I'm going to look 30 for the next 300 years, I can wait a few decades to get my family started. Combine that with far better birth control technology and an aging populace that's generally more experienced and thus probably has better judgment and more patience, and you probably do not have some massive population explosion waiting to happen. In the long term, yes, if people aren't dying much and people want kids, you do have a problem, but it's one with many possible answers, some better than others of course. For a lot of us the answer is more technology for ever better management and use of resources, and to expand to get more resources in space, on strange new worlds. I think for a lot of folks, overpopulation has been such a nightmare that seeing a growth rate decrease that maybe eventually leads to a stable population number is a dream come true, and so radical life extension can seem like it would just reopen that book, but the ethics remain the same in both cases. Do you or do you not have the right to tell others if they can or cannot have children, and if so, in what circumstances? But life extension as the extra dimension that we now have to ask if we have the right to tell other people they have lived too long, and need to make room for others. Though that was already a discussion point in the past, and not just in a Logan's Run context, but where people would ask if it was fair for retirees or seniors to continue living longer especially as the older they got, the more resources had to be spent on them on average. It comes up in figuring out how to structure social security and pensions, if the retirement age needs to be raised, if you would still get a pension if you retired and life extension was invented. And this is probably the origin of the rich force poor concern of unequal access to life extension. 
It's not only the dichotomy that unequal access can be built around, but probably the one we most hear brought up for life extension. Medicine costs money, and there is a limited number of practitioners too, so something has to determine where a given procedure for a given person is not a good use of resources. This isn't necessarily a utilitarian decision either, where the goal is the most good as justified by the outcome. We just as often use the opposed deontological perspective, the ends don't justify the means. And while the two positions are contradictory, we do generally try to heed both in our decision making. So who should get treatment? Well the default assumption is that life extension is a good or service someone can buy, so in a limited supply it goes to the richest. This doesn't necessarily assume it has to be an expensive treatment either. The pill that deages you might be cheaper than soda and taken just once a year, but your society might have decided that those using it have to pay a sin tax like most have for cigarettes and alcohol, or a Pigovian tax, which are the kind where society tries to figure out how much something costs and spread it fairly around those incurring the cost. Fuel taxes for roads are often based on this idea. Those who use them most pay the most for maintaining them as they use more fuel. And this need not be wealth, either. If your civilization is able and willing to give treatment to anyone who asks, all is well, and I think that's the most likely scenario for humanity in the coming centuries, but you might have places that say, yes, you can have it, but you must agree to be sterilized or take fertility blocking medications, as a way to avoid overpopulation, or that you can't have kids till you get off the anti-aging drugs or that you could have both but you had to do something to provide fundamental new resources, like go off to a colony planet where they need people. A civilization with unlimited access to longevity might only allow new people by someone winning the lottery, or losing it and having to migrate to the unsettled regions of the galaxy, or being killed in Logan's Run style, in which case you might ask if someone has the right to give or sell that commodity and if so when. Could I volunteer to take the hit if a famous scientist or artist whose work has helped millions was selected to die or immigrate? If so, then could I volunteer to take that hit for some billionaire and migrate to Alpha Centauri so he could remain here? Could I win the birth lotto and sell my kid token to a wealthy family who wanted a child? If not, could I give it to a couple who lost their only child in a tragic accident? And who decides which exceptions are okay? We have far more dystopian options too, and the most popular one of late seems to be that greedy 1% having nigh immortality while everyone else lives as their slaves, scrambling to get whatever job the robots aren't doing so they can live another day in that grungy cyberpunk inspired world. Your mileage may vary on if you think that is likely, but there's no motivation beyond scarcity to keep your masses miserable or short lived so it would imply you would have the same problem if you use different methods of determining haves and have-nots. A popular one is to let the scientists and philosophers have those extended lives, unsurprising given who usually discusses the topic, or that political leaders would get it, or that we might determine it by some sort of social worth, possibly determined by how many likes your profile gets or how good a citizen the state has determined you are. All in all, I'd say unequal access, for whatever reason, tends to be one folks hand wave away on this topic a bit too much, either assuming we will just fix this with ease, or that it's a later generation's problem, or that it is insoluble and we shouldn't pursue life extension because it will only make inequalities larger and harder to disrupt. That's not limited to money or access to life extension either. For instance, upward mobility would seem to be an inevitable issue of longer lived societies, If people can't pursue careers for centuries, then it would not be surprising if people's apprenticeship periods lasted decades, not months or years as now. It's easy to imagine Wait Your Turn being the de facto model of such a civilization, and people growing impatient at it. Wealth, power, and influence will absolutely gravitate to the elderly if they are keeping the bloom of youth and vigor, they have the experience, the connections, the patience, and already have more resources. There will still be a churn rate of folks entering and exiting those peak positions, but it's likely to be slow. In a post-scarcity civilization it's trickier too, because on the one hand, even if the top 1% controls 99% of the resources, control is not identical to usage, and there's still so much going around and nobody is poor. 
They may all get Porsches and their own robot maintained mansion when they turn 18, but they just aren't being allowed up the hierarchy, which is arguably worse on the human psyche. This isn't solved by looking at wealth and income either, because again, control isn't the same as usage. A billionaire controls billions of dollars of resources, but most are not consuming most of that, just directing what is done with it. They don't eat a billion dollars worth of food. And the same is true of elected leaders or nonprofit groups, they control huge budgets, and we need to be realistic, the heads of most organizations, elected or not, will tend to be selected for the same traits that extreme longevity permits, experience, connections, and reliability. All things being equal, someone who has been running the road department for 400 years and who is mediocre at it compared to his colleagues is still probably more knowledgeable of roads and infrastructure than any human currently alive. And we can't point to a placement and say, well, they may not know as much but they've got the energy and vigor and new ideas, because that's not necessarily true anymore, and anyone can come to the planning department in meetings and offer a new idea during public hearings for the board to consider. Heck, you can even join the board, we love new blood, Jessica over there joined us 30 years ago, just wait your turn. And when you appeal to others, they're likely to nod and smile and agree about it being unfair and even mean it, kind of, because they also tend to feel irritated at being stymied by their age, but also prone to electing leaders with vast experience and a reliable and stable track record. We looked at the impact of this more in our episode The Effects of Longer Lifespans, but ethically, it raises the issue of if it is fair to force people to live on the lower rungs until their turn comes, or vice versa, if we have any business saying some ancient and wise citizen needs to step aside and pass the reins on. It definitely makes the topic of term limits seem a bit more relevant, but I should note that a lot of us view the answer to this problem to be space and colonizing the galaxy. For at least a million years to come, there's always going to be a new frontier for folks to go to if they want to be part of the growing pyramid at an earlier stage. And people are very programmed to either climb the local social hierarchy or wander off to a new one, so this is likely to offer a possible solution. And at home too, as many folks higher on the existing pyramid are also likely to want to go abroad too, open middle and higher slots to be had. A post-scarcity civilization can offer a great life to that lowest rung, especially if you toss in virtual reality, but people tend to be most depressed and most disruptive to society when they feel like they have no option for ascending the local ladder, and no option for picking up and migrating, and space colonization would seem to offer a rather long-term solution to that problem, and if a better one for even longer term hasn't been figured out by then, well I still wouldn't feel it was wrong to have tried rather than waited but it isn't one we can casually dismiss either, and the same is true of slow technological progress. There is a concern that an aging body of scientists, or scholars and artists in general, is less creative and open to new ideas. This to me is something of a debatable thing, as it is rather oversimplifying what creativity or open-mindedness are. Nonetheless, we often see the best and most creative new work from people in their 20s and early 30s, and there's no guarantee that it has any relation to youthful vigor, it might be a greater openness to risk taking for instance, always easier when you feel you have less to lose. It might be the case though, so that a civilization of eternal youth might be one in which Einstein lives forever and keeps pumping out new material, or it might be that you do grow wiser and more effective with time, but get worse at coming up with new ideas. If so, that actually helps with the previous problem, as there's now a continuous need for bright young creatives in society and upward mobility from that, and since an automated society doesn't really need folks for much beyond creative work and decision making, and that's debatable too, that might be the only type of non-hobby jobs left around. On the other hand, if people maintain that creative edge and just grow in knowledge too, then it is unlikely technological progress would slow. We'll have to wait and see on this one, but as a caveat, we need to remember that one of the fundamental points of technology is to improve our lives, mostly by letting us have our cake and eat it too. It is not just that it can extend life, but improve training and help us understand boredom and hedonistic impulses, so that a civilization of non-aging folks is one that is noble and wise, not a bunch of slugs spending all day waited on hand and foot by robots or living VR fantasies. The other side of that though is that if you have achieved these things and technological progress slows, 
that is not necessarily an indictment of that civilization. See our post-science civilization episode for more discussion of that. The same is true of slow cultural change, in the sense that a truly just and ethical civilization has no need for fast changes. You hear the term stagnant, but a swamp is stagnant, a beautiful sculpture that doesn't change with time is called enduring instead. If it's a good civilization ruled by the old and wise then slow change would seem fine too. We can debate if it's ethical to force folks who want change, wise or not, to either endure it in this slow changing civilization or immigrate to a colony world, or just another different but established world. But that's a two way street, it is not inherently fair for folks to tell others that change is coming and they either need to adapt or leave. Both perspectives go over a lot better with a little basic human courtesy though, and I would not be surprised if life extended civilizations were very heavy on etiquette, for good and ill. I also don't see much reason to assume a longer lived society is inherently way more resistant to change, so they can't be swayed by good arguments for it. For my part, I'd rather win my case that way too, by swaying someone rather than waiting for the Reaper to do it for me. There's also no guarantee that your older population is your source of resistance to change either, the longer lived might initially push for a lot of it. This gets us to the concern though that longer lives might erode traditional human relationships, and that's another hard one to examine and one true for other technologies too. Does someone who has all their needs satisfied by robots and virtual reality need friends, spouses, real kids, and so on? And if so, is it ethical for us to say they are wrong to do that even if it erodes our civilization? Hard to say, and the same for how life extension might change these things. If I can live to a thousand, do I feel any real need to play grandparent? If I'm never planning to retire, do I feel a need to pay taxes to support programs and educations designed to replace me? Is this a society that is more prone to dumping huge resources into kids because they make up a small fraction of the population and are rare or treasured, or is it one where people say we are having way too many kids too fast and those having them need to be held accountable for that and not expect others to pay for it? As is often the case, the dilemma is not limited to this technology, but one that is specific to longevity is if it ends the need for children, and again since this isn't immortality, the answer is presumably no. Not in its entirety, but it may reduce it to virtually none, and ever fewer as time goes on. Right now, in the US, about a fifth to a quarter of the population are children, and of course that depends on where we're marking that line between child and adult. That's lower than it used to be, and indeed even in the past, when we said 13 made you an adult, it was still a higher percentage of kids. But if the median age is 800 not 80 and you never get enfeebled by time, that means something like 97% of your time is working as a taxpayer and only the first 20 or so years of life are principally education, unless maybe we expect people to work a century at learning before producing, which might actually be the case if it takes them a century to get good enough at anything to be better than we could program a robot, or the level we are willing to program a robot to be. On the flip side, the same highly automated culture wouldn't need 97% of its population as net producers given that robots can do so much. Outside of growth phases on new planets, it would seem like a long-lived civilization is one that probably is eventually in a slow to no growth period and only has as many kids as a percentage of their population as their lifespan divided by 18 is, if that is 900 years then 2% of the population are kids. Assuming even a tenth of the population still likes having little kids around, which would seem weirdly low, that still means every little kid would be spoiled for attention and resources. But I think as a civilization ages, its population will too, and keep seeing that median lifespan rising. Those who make it past the boredom or dangerous living phases might just keep going on not for centuries but millions of years, and they may not want a zero growth civilization. It is very likely by then that all the local resources are tapped and all neighbor resources are long since colonized and claimed, so they have a fixed pool of resources from now to eternity and might prefer that instead of making new people to replace their losses that they divvy up the remainder, or that the person who dies has a will dictating how their resources are to be used 
may be divided, may be given to make a new person, they are inheritance and trust fund. We could probably do a whole episode discussing the strange cultures and ethical issues of ultra-long-lived civilizations, but there is a question on if that's even a human civilization anymore, or if someone living many centuries and beyond is really human anymore. Living a very long time is likely to change your outlook a lot, but it's also likely to physically change your mind and body. Your brain is not designed to hold an indefinite amount of memories and you may not want to lose them, so various mind augmentation might be needed. You may need psychological change too, not just for things like boredom but also risk taking. Those who live longest are likely to be risk averse. Part of what might help for upward mobility if new businesses or enterprises are mostly founded by younger and more risk prone people, but you might modify your mind to be pro risk on anything without survival implications, while needing to alter it more so you are avoiding behaviors that have a higher risk on actuarial tables. Maybe parachuting is ultra safe, even safer in a higher tech future, but if that means only one in a million jumps is fatal. Well, that and a few other hobbies or lifestyles with similar risks might take you down, unless you could suppress that urge for risk taking. You may also have yourself brainwashed against any self destructive or suicidal impulse to ensure a future you who had a rough or boring century doesn't decide to end their existence or take up reckless hobbies. Or you just make yourself harder to kill, you cyborg up so you've got three hearts and a titanium skull, and your home is very damage resistant and had medical drones waiting to help you or upload your brain to the cloning banks, or repair your brain molecule by molecule from the most recent scan, and whatever was left over. Your whole body might merely be a human appearing avatar, and your home your real body, full of computer memory banks, and with copies uploaded regularly with updates to 20 different anonymous and ultra-secure memory storage vaults scattered throughout the solar system or even neighboring ones. You may occasionally add more brains too, and slowly but surely creep away from being human, so that at age 1 million you look out on the galaxy, now colonized, with eyes that see wavelengths they couldn't as a kid, and a mind that encompasses several thousand cubic meters of fortress, and somewhere along the line you stopped being human. That might be you or I too. It is entirely plausible that we may get major life extension technology in the next few generations, or get close enough that many of us ought to be frozen in our old age for nanotech restoration when that point is reached. That's the main list of life extension ethical issues themselves, but that gradual shift to something post-human does suggest one partial solution that we often contemplate for transhumanism in general, and that's a gradual approach. We do not know what life extension will look like, it might be a slow build up of age and new techs that incrementally help, or it might be something that just flat out invents an easy side effects free fix to aging that costs a couple bucks and more than pays for itself in lower medical costs from aging. If it is the incremental version, then we can gradually solve the problem, especially if it is below takeoff speed what we call it when life extension technology is adding at least one year of life to the average lifespan every year, versus the roughly one year of lifespan extension for every six that passed in more recent times. If it is an instant thing, it is not necessarily ruinous. As noted earlier, we already have more than twice as many people being born every day as die, so even if everyone stopped dying tomorrow, we would have no immediate crisis especially as I think a lot of folks would slow down on starting families without the normal deadline. And we can assume that the deadline would move back eventually too, though fertility periods might not instantly expand to keep up with lifespans, we've discussed that more in other episodes though, so there should not be any need or justification for slow walking or stalling life extension technology to give us more time to adapt to it. In an extreme case though, If we felt we needed a more gradual increase in lifespan, we could always insist that after a certain age, you have to go on ice until we figure out how to handle the problem, at maybe 120, and we just tell everyone that even if we don't solve the issues, we will still wake them up for another couple decades of life even if we decided 100 was a good maximum age. Note that throughout this we have assumed that we are not just extending life but vitality and you're not just getting more decrepit with time. Most technological pathways assume we're restoring vitality or uploading you to a computer rather than you just aging and aging somehow, 
but if that was the technology for life extension, then that doesn't seem much of an ethical issue, and is akin to boredom, if that life is now unpleasant, you have an obvious solution, and for my part, I'd rather that was left up to that person to pick if they wanted to end things, as opposed to us making them, or banning the technology so they didn't have the choice. Your mileage may vary of course. In summary, we've seen today what most of the issues with life extension are, many we can't answer conclusively, they are subjective or need to wait and see what an extended civilization looks like to judge. I feel the case does strongly tilt toward yes though, that life extension is ethical and if it is not, trying to achieve it and finding out firsthand still leaves the option of finding out it was a mistake and abandoning it. But the ethical problems and challenges of radical life extension seem either ones we have with other technologies or ones that we can manage, especially over the next several millennia when expansion into our solar system and the galaxy beyond seems to beckon so enticingly as a perfect solution. The galaxy is a huge place with more worlds than people, indeed more worlds than people who ever lived in total, and you might still be around and kicking a thousand years or a million, on Earth or some worlds you helped found. All these ethical issues, even to the extreme cases, may be ones we need to take seriously because they might be our problems, and if not, probably our kids or grandkids' problems. And as the first ones pass the post, those issues of what to do later, and haves and have-nots, are our responsibility. The good news is, you would be very likely to be on the top of that heap. After all, in a galaxy of quadrillions, even if you just set aside a few bucks a week to get compound interest or buy penny stocks in future colonies as they begin rolling out. The galaxy is enormous and ancient, and there is a real chance you or I might be around to see a galactic humanity become enormous and ancient too. Today we discuss life extension and contemplated living untoward periods of time maybe even eons ahead, to see the Dark Era after all the stars burn out. But there was another Dark Age, not too long after the Big Bang, before normal stars began to form, an era in which there may have been strange stellar objects, dark stars, and other phenomena we believe may have existed back then. We'll explore that topic in this month's Nebula original, Dark Stars at the Beginning of Time, which is out now on Nebula, our streaming service. On Nebula, you not only get to see every regular episode of SFIA a few days early and ad-free, along with content by an ever-growing pool of awesome creators, but all of SFIA's bonus content, including extended editions of mini-episodes, and more Nebula original episodes like Life as an Asteroid Minor, Nomadic Minors on the Moon, Space Freighters, Retro Causality, Orc OR and Free Will, Conformal Secret Cosmology, Colonizing Binary Stars, and more. Using my link and discount, it's available now for just over $2.50 a month, which helps support new content from myself and other creators. When you sign up at my link, go.nebula.tv slash IsaacArthur, and use my code, IsaacArthur, you not only get access to all the great stuff Nebula offers, you'll also be directly supporting this show. Again to see SFIA early, ad-free, and with all the exclusive bonus content, go to go.nebula.tv slash IsaacArthur. Before we jump into our upcoming episodes, I want to let everyone know about an upcoming space conference, Space Visions, this November 9th to 11th in Washington, D.C., being put on by Students for Exploration and Development of Space, or SEDS. SEDS is an excellent student-led nonprofit creating and connecting students nationwide with interdisciplinary opportunities to impact the future of the space industry. With over 85 chapters, find the one nearest you, or create your own, and get involved as a student or as a project advisor by visiting SEDS.org. SEDS marquee event, Space Vision, is a student-oriented three-day conference focused on introducing the breadth of the space industry to students, including many of the topics we discuss on this channel such as rockets, space stations, and various in-space services and applications. There are educational panels, a career fair, live competitions, and social networking events. Celebrate with them the 40th anniversary of SEDS conferences this year at DC in early November. For more information, check out spacevision.seds.org. And speaking of upcoming discussions of space, we'll be returning to space to look at the idea of entire fortified planets in space empires with Fortress Worlds on October 26th. 
then we'll finish October with our monthly livestream Q&A on the 29th. Then on November 2nd we will ask if rebel space colonies that we often contemplate in sci-fi and futurism might occur and what they'll be like. Before we release our big 3 hour long updated and extended edition of the Fermi Paradox Compendium on November 9th. Then on November 12th it will be Sci-Fi Sunday where we'll discuss human-alien hybrids like the famous half-Vulcan half-human science officer Spock from Star Trek and we'll ask if they could exist and even live long and prosper. While you're waiting for those to come out, you can check out last weekend's Sci-Fi Sunday episode, Forge Worlds and Industrial Planets, or this month's Nebula exclusive, Dark Stars at the Beginning of Time. If you'd like to get alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notification buttons. You can also support the show on Patreon, and if you want to donate and help in other ways, you can see those options by visiting our website, IsaacArthur.net. You can also catch all of SFIA's episodes early and ad free on our streaming service Nebula, along with hours of bonus content at go.nebula.tv slash Isaac As always, thanks for watching and have a great week.